Hello, scholars, and welcome back. This is Vanessa Valdez in sunny Southern California on our last day of the AP Live Art History Review for 2021. And today I'm going to start by answering a few questions that came in through the Google form, discuss the exam format in order of the questions, and then I'll review the homework and go into review of works from early and later Europe centered on the theme of the female body and the tradition of the reclining nudes in European art. Then at the end, I'll give you some final tips and reminders for the AP exam. So let's begin. Before we start, here is our resource pool that we've made available to you at our Google folder, which uh, includes the course exam description, updated exam info, scoring guidelines, study resources, practice prompts. So definitely check that out. Also, I did find out new clarifying information about identifying info on the digital AP exam. This information was just released by College Board to clarify the language of how the digital exam will be different regarding identifiers. And you can view this in the 2021 exam formats. It has recently been updated. So this is what it reads. It reads, on the digital exam for art history, due to requirements for exam security, works of art won't be identified. Also, students won't be asked to provide identifying information for works of art that are provided as stimuli in free response questions. So that first sentence means for questions on the digital exam where an image is included, there is no identifying caption that would be provided on the print exam. Students would be or students should be able to recall information about the work of art necessary to answer the question based on the visual stimulus alone. The second statement refers or references the change to the first task for both FRQ1 and FRQ2 as they will appear on the 2021 digital exam. In a typical exam year, students must provide two accurate identifiers, such as the artist or culture title media date for the object they choose to discuss in order to achieve a point for identification. But this task, identifying the work, will not be assessed on the 2021 digital FRQ1 or FRQ2. Students taking the 2021 digital exam should specify in some way which object they have chosen to write about, especially if they discuss an object other than the options provided. This will ensure that the response can be scored accurately. Ideally, a student would indicate the artist and or title of their chosen work, but there is no point awarded for providing this information. So hopefully this helps clarify uh, what they mean by the fact that the digital exam will not ask for identifiers for this uh, FRQ, FRQ 1 and 2, but will still require some way of identifying the work you're discussing. Here are some questions that came in through the Google form. If I'm giving two identifiers for a work, would saying wood and pigment get me the point, or would I have to say something other than a material along with that? So the, the rule with this and with the identifiers for FRQ uh, 1 and, and 2, um, 2 especially, you, you would have to use uh, two categories of ID information beyond those given. So if it gives you the title of the work, then you would give them, you know, you say wooden pigment as the material, but you also have to give them another identifier. So you have to have two accurate identifiers. Wood and pigment are two materials, but you have to have two categories of ID information beyond the info given. So you can mix the categories however you want, but it would be like material and title, material and artist, material and culture, and so forth. In terms of context, is the name of a region or movement specific enough, such as Baroque or Eastern Asia, or is a more specific name needed, such as Spanish Baroque or Japanese? I think that this person understands uh, it, it really is um, not good to have a general name for the name um, or region. It's not specific enough. So for context, you really do have to say Spanish Baroque or Japanese. You can't just say it's East Asian. No, you have to say, you know, it's, it's um, from China, the Song Dynasty, or it's from uh, Edo, Japan, or it's Japanese. So be specific. Will there be a camera watching us taking the AP exam? No, there will not. This is a privacy issue and there will not be a camera watching you take the exam. How many of the FRQs do not provide an image or an image in the set? Only one does not provide an image and that's the long visual contextual analysis essay. So if you're taking the paper test, that'll be 
uh, essay number two. And if you're taking the digital exam, that'll be essay number one. So I'll go over this with you in a second. Uh, just a reminder that this is the info that you need to know for each work, uh, identifier information, form, content, context, and function. And those four are defined on the last page of the course and exam description, the Google Drive folder. And of course, uh, Smart History has uh, most of the information that you need to know for these works in your set. And uh, I highly encourage you to watch the AP Daily videos and unit faculty lectures on AP Classroom uh, for works or skills that you feel like you need to review. So in these sessions over the last two weeks, we've really tried to focus on works that didn't have AP Daily videos or that needed more in-depth information. So please don't forget about those AP Daily resources because those will supplement your understanding of the works and uh, they're designed to give you a leg up on the exam. So you should use them. Going into the exam, I want to remind you about the content breakdown, which is in the course description. And judging by the content makeup of this exam, units two, three, four, and 10 really make up the greatest percentage of works on the exam. So if I were studying for this exam, I would spend more time studying those than the works in the other units. Now, at the same time, you really can't ignore those smaller percentages because there will be these percentages of works on the um, content areas on the actual exam. So College Board is all about global representation. So be prepared to discuss works from categories that have less of an exam weight. OK, so here is just the question order and number of questions, timing. The exam is three hours long for AP Art History. You get one hour for multiple choice questions and two hours for FRQs. And on the paper exam, as you see over here on the right, this is for the paper version. This is the order of your sections. And within each section, you are free to go between questions. So that includes multiple choice and FRQs. So you can go you know, back and forth between the multiple choice questions when you're taking that section. You can go back and forth between the FRQs when you're in that section. So this is a different policy than the digital exam. So here's the digital exam. This is the order of your sections in the digital exam, and you can't travel back and forth between questions on this digital exam. You have to take, take each section at a time and each question at a time within that section. And please note that on the digital exam, the order of the long comparison essay and the long visual contextual essay will be switched. So the comparison essay on the digital version will be uh, question two. And the long visual contextual analysis will be question one. OK, now what will we learn today? Let's check it out. Here is the practice prompt that I gave you for homework yesterday on the contextual analysis FRQ. And let's read it together. The work shown is the night attack on the Sanjo Palace, created in Japan during the Kamakura period. Describe at least two visual elements that reflect the culture in which this work was created. Using at least two examples of specific evidence, explain how the original context influenced the choice of imagery. And using specific contextual evidence, explain how this work reflects the aesthetics of the group who commissioned it. The first task, uh, describe at least two visual elements that reflect the culture in which this work was created. Uh, visual elements include the use of oblique angles, negative space in the background. Uh, the story starts on the right and moves to the left. Uh, it's an illustrated narrative scroll or imaki. Uh, it uses flat color um, patterns, which is something that you would see in Japanese woodcuts. Uh, women in kimonos, warriors in Japanese armor, strong diagonals and horizontal lines. Uh, the Kamakura period with art representing the Heian period uh, would have represented the unrest of that period. Uh, Japanese armor, horses, and weapons. You could say samurai armor as well. Using at least two examples of specific evidence, explain how the original context influenced the choice of imagery. So you could say strong diagonals and horizontal lines, uh, such as the billowing fabric, the shafts of the carts, the, le the leaning, should say leaning bodies, sorry, uh, reinforce the swift and surprised nature of the Heiji Rebellion, which occurred at night. Overlapping of multiple figures and variety of patterns, colors, and forms reflect the chaos of the Heiji Rebellion. 
The Heiji Rebellion was a horrific episode in the Heian period, and thus it depicts gory details. Men dressed in armor with weapons represent the samurai who stormed the palace in the Heiji Rebellion. Uh, this was a major event in the Japanese Civil War in the 12th century. Uh, despite expressions of the uh, inhabitants of the palace, uh, desperate expressions of the inhabitants of the palace, and the grotesque appearance of some of the rebels cast the rebels in an unfavorable light. The artist clearly wanted to show the rebel attackers as inhuman, uh, bloodthirsty, and almost animal-like. Also, uh, there is an empty cart on the far right side of the scroll and a full cart on the far left, illustrating the episode in which the samurai brought a cart into the palace to imprison or kidnap the retired em em emperor and emerge from the palace with the emperor held hostage. All right, last task. Using specific contextual evidence, explain how this work reflects the aesthetics of the group who commissioned it. So this is an imaki, which is a picture hand scroll. It's a Japanese picture hand scroll that heavily features warriors uh, reflecting the new age military government called the Bakufu or the shogunate that overthrew the imperial court. Uh, fighting scenes with ample negative space reflect the aesthetics of militant clans. And so were called otoke -e. I think it's oto otoko-e. Uh, men's paintings during the Kamakura period when the shogun and the samurai held political power. So that was an example of a, a contextual analysis. And so I hope that was helpful for a review of that particular work. All right, so we're going to take a look at the short FRQ on continuity and change today. So one of the short free response questions on the art history exam requires an analysis of what's called artistic traditions. And this is written in 15 minutes. It's a short one. It assesses students' ability to analyze the relationships between a work of art and a related artistic tradition, style, and or practice. Um, one image from the set is provided. Students must respond to the prompt using both visual and contextual information. Students must explain how or why the work of art demonstrates continuity or change within an artistic tradition or practice. Students must also analyze the meaning or significance of an art historical interpretation of the work of art provided. And the skill of analyzing artistic traditions reflects 20 to 25% of multiple choice questions and at least one FRQ. Okay, so this is another important, another important skill, which is why we have to spend some time with it today. So the essay on continuity and change will require visual analysis. We've talked this, talked about this pretty much every day of the AP live lecture. So if you need a review, you can go all the way back to session one. Uh, we are going to use contextual analysis for this essay. And with artistic traditions, this, this skill is new. As I said, it's about analyzing the relationships between a work of art and a related artistic tradition, style, or practice. So, um, for example, students will be asked to explain how a specific work of art uh, or a group of related works demonstrates continuity and or change within an artistic tradition, style, or practice, and, and why it uh, depicts continuity or change, and explain the meaning or the significance of the continuity and change, and so forth. So these are all things that you would be, um, that you could be asked to do. All right, so let's go ahead and look at an example from a real AP exam. I'll break it down for you, and then we'll go ahead and dive into a review. This is an example from the 2017 exam. And remember, this is a short essay, so you get 15 minutes. Um, and let's, let's read the prompt. Describe at least two visual characteristics of, on, uh, I think it's uh, Angra's representation of the female nude. Uh, using specific visual evidence, explain how Le Grand Odalesque demonstrates established traditions in the representation of the female nude. Using specific visual evidence, explain how the Grand Odalisque demonstrates changes from established traditions in the representation of the female nude. And using specific contextual evidence, explain why Angra deviated from established traditions in his representations of the female nude. Okay, lots of female nude and demonstrating traditions and change. And so let's walk through this one step at a time. You always gotta take it one step at a time or else it's very overwhelming. 
So here's a breakdown of where the points are earned. I've kind of dissected this for you. And this is the formula for these types of questions. You usually have uh, two visual pieces. You see at the top here, visual characteristics, visual characteristics. All you have to do is describe visual characteristics. And then these last three have to do with you know, how or why they demonstrate change in continuity. All right, here is a breakdown. Um, uh, I kind of separated this for you. So visual versus change in continuity, where you have to explain how it does that using specific evidence, either visual or contextual. Let's begin. All right, describe at least two visual characteristics. So we could say the female nude is represented with restrained eroticism, elegance, and sensual appeal. She is reclining on a divan with her back toward the viewer, propped up on one arm while the other reaches down the length of her body, crossing her legs with one hand holding a fan, brushing her lower leg, looking over her shoulder at the viewer with a calm, neutral expression. Uh, she is unclothed except for a turban and jewelry, uh, idealized rather than natural or realistic, elongated and sinuous, bathed in an even light. And then using specific visual evidence, explain how the Grand Odalisque demonstrates established traditions and the representation of the female nude. Okay, so this is a more complex question. It's not just describing, it's about explaining. So how do we connect the visual evidence with these traditions? So you could say the sensual female nude is common subject matter in Western art, especially since the Renaissance revived and adapted the tradition from antiquity. Angra's painting recalls precedents of Giorgione, Velasquez, and Titian. The reclining post and direct gaze specifically recall Titian's Venus of Urbino, as does the figure's placement on a bed in a private space. In both composition and technique, the painting follows principles of neoclassicism from Angre's study with David at the French Royal Academy. And these principles include overall compositional balance and harmony, clear linearity and defining forms, emphasis on skills of draughtsmanship or draftsmanship, and precise naturalism and meticulous detail and form, invisible brushwork that creates a smooth surface of the painting. Using specific visual evidence, explain how Le Grand Odalisque demonstrates changes from the traditions of the reclining nude. Okay, so changes. Angra's rejected neoclassical subject matter in favor of romantic themes, abandoning the classical mythology of Venus for an imagery, uh, imaginary exotic culture. Uh, Angra rejected the Figures mysterious, foreign appeal in the general presentation and supporting details, such as the turban, the fan, and the hookah, making the female nude herself an article of luxury and desire. Angra used anatomical distortions to create a sense of elegance and sinuousness at the expense of, classically, of a classically idealized figure, typical of the academic and neoclassical nudes. And the positioning of the figures back toward the viewer is really a change from the classical and Renaissance types. Because remember, Titian's Venus was really open and frontal. Using specific contextual evidence, explain why Angra de uh, deviated from established traditions and his representations of the female nude. Okay, so this is even uh, a step further. Explain why he deviated, not just how, but why he deviated from these traditions. Um, you could say he was trying to capitalize on an interest in the exotic. The painting was created during a time of increasing fascination with the Orient due to French colonial and military expansion. Angra collected objects and artifacts and also copied traveler's accounts, including descriptions of harems. As an Orientalist fantasy, the work presents these cultures as sensual, static, and undeveloped, supporting political, moral imperatives for um, imperialism, as well as providing viewers safe moral distance to enjoy the blatant eroticism of Angra's presentation of the female nude. The distortion and sharp bright colors also reveal the artist's interest in mannerism. So this is how your uh, answer tasks on an, or how you would answer uh, tasks on an essay about continuity and change. So I hope this is uh, clear and I'm going to go through some review with you so that you guys feel more confident about this tradition. And also, um, not only are we going to go over the tradition of the reclining nude, but we're going to look at some other paintings 
uh, in European art. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, here are the works that we're going to do a deep dive with today. Uh, however, like I said, there's a handful of other works from early and later European art that we will review in the process. And we're going to time travel right now and start by going back to the Italian Renaissance. Are you guys ready? All right, so starting with the ancient Greeks, you know, women were almost never represented nude in European art unless they were associated with the, the Greek goddess Aphrodite or, um, you know, Venus. And in fact, uh, during the Middle Ages, historians didn't really find many female nudes at all unless they were associated with Eve from the book of Genesis. Uh, for medieval Christians, Eve was really the downfall of man in the story of creation. And by listening to Satan, you know, via the wily serpent, you, know, you see here in Durr's print on the left, and then eating the fruit of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, Eve's name really became synonymous with aspects of shame, sinful lust, and immorality. So they did not, artists did not depict nude women in the Middle Ages, even Venus, unless she was associated with Eve and immorality. And then here on the left, we have Adam and Eve by Albrecht Dürer. This is a Northern Renaissance engraving, and he uh, specialized in printmaking. And this became his uh, sort of business card. His name is inscribed here on the sign below the parrot. And uh, this work is highly detailed. It represents his skills with engraving copper plate. And this kind of uh, this is kind of an outlier, I think, in Northern Renaissance work at the time, because if you compare it to Grunewald's Isenheim altarpiece, for example, you see that other Northern Renaissance bodies were much more slender and vertical, uh, not very warm and realistic. So something unique about Durer as a Northern Renaissance artist is that he studied Greek and Roman sculptures and the anatomy of the human body in Italy, which is why these figures on the left has, have such full muscular bodies. <clears throat> He is also, you know, Durer is also a naturalist, and so he looks to nature as his guide for his subjects, and uh, like the artists in the Italian Renaissance. So this print on the left was made around the same year that Michelangelo made his colossal statue of David, just as a frame of reference. Now Botticelli on the right, uh, with his Birth of Venus, is credited as the first artist to revive the female nude of the Greco-Roman period for the figure of Venus. And even that was considered scandalous at the time because no one had seen a female nude in art for nearly a thousand years, except for Eve. So we should know that Venus is a figure who not only represents love and beauty, but she also represented charitable beauty to some. And she is often depicted with rose petals, which we see in the painting here being blown to her by the Western wind. So Botticelli, you know, was an intellectual, he was an intellect in an intellectual circle, and that included uh, philosophers and poets, and it was really the philosopher Ficini who encouraged a reading of an earthly Venus figure as a symbol of God's divine beauty through the lens of Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism is this term that we use, um, which understood that things on earth were uh, that were, that were good, I should say, and beautiful reflected the goodness and beauty of God. And thus Venus and her worldly beauty reflected the love and beauty of the Christian God. So Botticelli's nude Venus was gradually accepted over time, but when it was first created, there were officials in the Florentine government, such as Savonarola, who wanted to burn this painting because images of the female nude had long been considered taboo. Now, around 50 years before Botticelli's Venus, Donatello had revived the male nude figure in art, which had not been, been seen since the Greco-Roman classical period as well. Uh, Donatello even employed the ancient technique of lost wax bronze casting to create the figure, which was a method that the Greeks used to create their bronzes. So um, because nudity had long been associated with shame during the Middle Ages, these two works uh, had to be kept in private, away from the public eye for a long time. And like Botticelli's Venus, you know, Donatello's David is believed to have been commissioned by uh, the Medici family in Florence. 
Uh, actually, uh, I'm pretty sure we, we know that Donatello's David was commissioned by the Medici. I think it's the Botticelli's Venus that we're still wondering about um, and confirming if it was commissioned by the Medici in Florence for their private collection. Um, they did they did commission other mythologies with Venus and the Medici were big patrons of art in Renaissance Florence. So after Botticelli's Venus, the female nude gradually made its way into Renaissance art again. And we see that uh, pastoral nudes, uh, sometimes we see paintings from that period of these pastoral nudes who appeared to be relaxing or dancing, even frolicking in nature. And they were not seen as real women, but rather as personifications of nature, goddesses or muses, for example. Mythologies in particular were very popular. So on the right is this painting that was begun by an artist named Giorgione called The Sleeping Venus, who appears as a nude woman who has fallen asleep in a tranquil pastoral landscape. So this is actually the first reclining Venus that sort of appears to be a real woman here on the right, because she looks more real to us than Botticelli's Venus uh, due to her naturalistic body, her sense of gravity and landscape. Um, and to us, she may appear to be a real woman who has fallen asleep, you know, in the, in the countryside here, but because this woman is out in nature and she's sleeping, she's not associated with shame like, like Eve, but rather she was intended as a Venus or a personification of what Venus stands for. So that made it okay for him to paint this woman nude. Uh, I mentioned Giorgione because he had a profound influence on Titian and you see Titian's name here alongside Giorgione's under the painting. And that's because, you know, Titian started off as an assistant to Giorgione and shortly afterward, they became contemporaries founding the Venetian school of Italian Renaissance painting. So Titian actually finished that painting on the left and he learned from Giorgione how to render soft three-dimensional modeling of the body and how to master oil paint and the handling of color. On the right is the Venus of Urbino by Titian in our set, which demonstrates great influence in form and content uh, by Giorgione's Venus uh, or from Giorgione's Venus. But one of the big differences is that Titian is really pushing the boundaries a little and he's associating his reclining nude with the soon to be bride of the Duke of Urbino. And so by putting this reclining nude woman um, in a man-made setting, uh, it, that it's a real bedroom. <laughs> He's really liberating the female nude from nature and associating her with a, with a domestic goddess or a real woman surrounded by symbols of marriage. And, you know, this painting on the right, it was not originally called the Venus of Urbino. Uh, I think Vasari is the first one to really call her a Venus. Uh, and that was like 30 years after the painting was made. But it was originally called the nude woman, La Dana Nuda. And historians largely concur that this painting on the right was commissioned by the Duke of Urbino to celebrate his marriage to a young woman. So it was gonna be a wedding gift, <laughs> but um, he, he referred to it as the nude woman. That's, how, that's what he called it. And we see symbols of marriage that are here in the painting, such as the sleeping dog, which represents fidelity, the two servants in the back who are sifting through a marriage chest called the cassoni which represents the dowry of the family that would have been delivered to the nuptial room as a transaction of the marriage between the father of the bride and the husband. And we also see roses in her hand and the myrtle tree in the back. You see the myrtle back here on the windowsill. And those are all symbols of love and the goddess Venus. So Titian is credited with a lot of things in art history, notably that he established oil painting on canvas as a preferred medium in Italy. And he also established compositional elements and uh, the standard for paintings of the reclining female nude because it was this painting, not Giorgione's, that became known in Venice. And eventually wealthy male patrons around Italy and France who were attracted to the eroticism of these images commissioned them in large numbers. And in France, this would become a very popular subject in the form of the Odalisque. But remember, this painting was for private eyes only for a time. Uh, Titian's woman reclines on this nice gentle slope of the couch pillows and this luxurious uh, neutral white linen that seems to complement and enhance her, the warm glow of her skin. And she's represented with the ideal full body of a Renaissance woman, a slightly rounded tummy, which alludes to fertility. 
and her body is relaxed, giving way to the couch while she softly clutches the red roses and grazes her fingers along her inner thigh right over her private area. And her hair is blonde, which is not a natural color for most Italians, but having golden hair was highly desired and considered idyllic. And so women would actually bleach their hair in the Renaissance, even though it wasn't natural. Her body is very open to the viewer. It's, it's actually on, on display. Her hair is down and she coyly tilts her head toward the pillow as if to invite someone to rest with her. She gazes lovingly at the viewer with an invitation and a little smile on the corner of her lips. So because of the nature of this woman as idyllic and inviting, we say that this is a commodity for the male gaze. So you should write that down for this work. Uh, the male gaze is the notion that men were the commissioners and artists of art that objectified women or made them passive passive subjects for male consumption. And certainly these kinds of paintings became very popular. In the late Renaissance, a style called mannerism emerged and that was mostly in Italy and it featured elongated limbs and ambiguity of space and figure, disorientation, uh, artifice, which is when the artist very clearly is, is trying to trick you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of tension and cramped composition. So you can see like here, this is, this is not in your set, but it's a great example. This is called Madonna with the long neck. It's not very natural for a woman to have a neck like that. And then this baby has a very long torso and limbs. And same thing here. We see elongation of the torso of Christ and then entombment. So uh, what about this style? You know, I, I think that Pontormo in your set is really a great example of mannerism. Uh, this is why it's one of the reasons it's in your set. It's really a poster child. And like, if you look at this man here, uh, it's really hard to tell if this man on the bottom is really wearing a pink Under Armour shirt or if that is his actual skin color, for example. And then how is it possible that he can be lifting a large male body on his back and his shoulders while he's standing on his tiptoes? It just doesn't make any sense. So this is a really interesting style. It's, it was deliberate. Um, it was a deliberate attempt by artists to break the rules of the Renaissance because of what was going on historically. So context wise, for the Mannerists, the Protestant Reformation had just begun in the North under Martin Luther, and the institution of the Catholic Church was falling apart. It was trying to figure out how to reform itself. And not only this, but the same year that Pontormo painted the Entombment of Christ was the sack of Rome by Charles V, who invaded Italy. So artists are going to shock audiences with their, their impressions of the world at this time and their expressiveness. So um, a lot of these paintings are still very religious subjects, but they feel like they have more freedom to break the rules because of the tension and disorientation of what's going on in their fatherland. Moving forward in time, right before the French Revolution, we see neoclassical paintings take the stage in the art academies. And these paintings were technically refined with fine blended brush strokes and clear references to the Greco-Roman period, which they believed was a time of perfection of the state and society. So these paintings really sent clear moral messages that were intended to teach good citizenship and good virtues. And this painting in particular by Jacques-Louis David uh, really draws on an ancient narrative about the Harati brothers who had to represent Romans in settling a feud with Alba, which was another territory. So here are the three brothers on the left. These are the Harati brothers, and they're taking a vow, vow with their father, who's here in the center. And they're taking a vow to fight to the death on behalf of their family and the Romans. So this is really a painting of heroism that glorifies war, which is fitting considering that uh, David was the master of propaganda for the French Revolution, working alongside Robespierre and Marat. So this painting is not only technically exemplary of the academic style of neoclassicism, which was popular at the time, but it was also a call to action. It was spurring revolutionaries to fight for their freedoms in the French Revolution. 
David's uh, pupil was the French artist Angra, who painted the Grand Odalisque. And Angra would go on to spend 18 years studying in Italy. And here he studied classical antiquity and Renaissance art and eventually became a member of the Art Academy in Paris. And he employs very precise draftsmanship that is neoclassical in style, like his teacher, David. But he breaks away from David by featuring a romantic subject. So French society at the time really had a great interest in distant lands with Napoleon's invasion of, of Egypt and other military expansion in uh, West, I think West Asia and North Africa mostly. But this fascination of Westerners with people from areas around the Middle and the Near East became known as Orientalism, which is also connected to exoticism because these are Westerners who are thinking about these people in other territories through a Western lens. Uh, part of the Orientalist fantasy involved Europeans looking at these cultures as static, exotic, undeveloped, without really getting to know the people, which provided imperatives for um, imperialism. So both of these artists, Angra and Delacroix, were interested in Eastern subjects and the figure of the Odalisque, who is a white female sex slave in a harem or brothel. And Delacroix had actually visited North Africa, and he saw these women in Algiers and Morocco, but Angra had not. He had not traveled beyond Italy. So interestingly, he's commissioned by Napoleon's sister to do this uh, painting, and uh, he actually took inspiration from the books and accounts that he had read. So this is a real kind of fantasy picture here on the left that's intended for both private and public consumption. And you can see here that the, the face of the figure uh, was actually inspired by Raphael's paintings and his faces. And her body is really a hybrid between a real reclining nude and a mannerist fantasy with her very elongated torso. She has extra vertebrae in her torso, and she also has these very languid limbs. So she's also a little closed off from us. She has her back turned away, and um, this is supposedly because she was an odalisque for the sultan alone, um, because we see the blue curtains, which are a symbol of royalty and luxury objects, such as the peacock feathers and the silk. Because Angra was painting in the neoclassical style and using romantic uh, themes and subjects, he was actually criticized by the romantics for being a havesy. You know, Delacroix was his arch enemy and these two often derided each other. So now we fast forward a little bit more and we arrive in the mid 1800s when we have the advent of photography and this trend away from the academy towards social realism. And social realism was really pioneered by Courbet, you know, the artist of the Stonebreakers. And realism was a movement in France that was interested to depict the world around them as they saw it, uh, which included painting the people that art critics didn't always want to see. So this style really shed light on the working class and the truth of society in modern France. And here on the left, we have a painting by Edouard Manet, which was done at the same time as he painted Olympia. And Luncheon on the Grass really marks Manet's criticism of the ways of painting in Europe and the way that the academy was dis displaying and uh, featuring certain kinds of paintings. And he was interested really to move beyond the rules of the academy and employ looser brushstrokes and unidealized figures and a challenge to the male gaze. The Academy at the time, it was filled with paintings of nude women who were passive and idealized. And as someone who had traveled a lot and studied the working class and people whom the critics did, didn't want to see, Manet thought that the real world actually was much more interesting of a place than what the Academy in Paris was offering. So Manet breaks the rules. So Luncheon on the Grass was really submitted to the Salon of Paris in 1863, but it was rejected and it was put in a show of rejects. So this work on the left actually became the subject of mockery and confusion for a lot of people. 
Uh, we see here a naked woman on the grass with harsh, unideal lighting. And uh, she's in a casual setting. Her clothes are in disarray on the grass. And this woman looks at the viewer with no shame or sense of civilized decency. So it's clear that she does not represent a goddess. She represents a real woman because she is unidealized. And um, But even more so, the Academy critics are really disturbed because Manet rejects the rules of painting which are really manifested in Olympia on the right. So one critic at the salon, he describes, he said, never has a painting excited so much laughter, mockery, and catcalls as this Olympia. And everyone is astonished at the jury for admitting it. And this was common. We heard a lot of feedback from this exhibit, lots of critics, lots of criticism. And when Manet submitted this painting to the Paris Salon in 1865, it was heavily criticized. It was not so much that the main subject, the reclining nude, was supposed to represent a prostitute, but it was really a combination of factors that made it unconventional. So first, this figure is not idealized or passive. She has a look of defiance on her face and her body language. So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, she's staring back at the viewer in this challenging way as if we've interrupted her. And with her fingers flexed and tense, she, she staunchly covers herself and crosses her legs to bar entry to the male gaze unless they pay her as a client. And not only does Manet comment on social issues in France in this painting, but he also wants to challenge artistic traditions, which is the underlying significance of this painting. And on the right, I've listed ways that he does this, but I'm going to go dive into them more in depth right now. So when we compare these two works side by side, we should note both the subtle and the obvious differences in form. We know that Manet directly appropriated and used Titian's Venus of Urbino as the inspiration for his composition of, Olymp of, uh, of Olympia, because he sketched the Titian of Urbino uh, several times when he studied in Florence. And instead of using you know, soft blending or blended modeling of the female figure and feathered brush strokes like Titian, Manet really uses flat color and rough, loose brush strokes. You can really see it down here on the mattress and the shawl, for example. And that rejected Renaissance conventions. Now, the Academy did not like Manet's style of painting, but there were people who did, such as Claude Monet and Renoir and Degas. And, you know, Claude Monet, of course, becomes leader of the Impressionist movement. Uh, he praised Manet, which is why some consider Manet the father of modern art. Formally, Manet creates this harsh, overexposed lighting on the figure. There's this lack of midtones or shadow. There's an elimination of linear perspective and the background that was President Titian's painting. And then Manet flip-flops the positions of the green and red colors in the back. And he has these abrupt shifts in uh, tone. So what I mean by that is, you know, Manet's painting has an abrupt transition between like the light lights and the dark darks, and then going back to the stark lighting. It was really deemed offensive by critics, and it made them angry. So he transforms uh, Titian's myrtle plant in the back to a bouquet of flowers in the front from one of her clients, from one of Olympia's clients, which is delivered by a black woman or a paid servant. And the presence of this Black woman actually would have reflected French society authentically and made people feel kind of uncomfortable because she's a reminder of the racial differences in society and the remnants of their French colonial history. In content, Manet emphasizes the fact that Olympia is a prostitute uh, through a number of attributes that are not classical references like Titian had. Um, Manet made no attempt to make her an idealized or passive woman. And the title of the painting as Olympia is really his first testament to this, since that was a well-known name for a prostitute. He also gave her the tacky habit of wearing slippers in bed, a black cat on the cushion, which is a symbol of promiscuity instead of a sleeping dog. And the shawl that she's lying on would have been a gift from a client as well. So Manet's reclining nude was not easy for people to look at because she was not inviting in form or gesture. 
Now, regardless of this upset in the art world and how harshly he was criticized, Manet really went on to inspire a number of young artists who embraced and celebrated his rejection of the rules. And they began to paint with looser brushstrokes and fragmented forms, such as the Impressionists, who include Monet, Renoir, and then the post-Impressionist Cezanne and the Cubist Picasso. So Manet's legacy is inspiring many of these artists in Paris to break away uh, from the traditions of the Academy and to experiment with their own styles. And, you know, our cat, Mochi, uh, thought to appropriate uh, Manet's Olympia recently and make it her own. So here she is. And it would seem that Manet's influence really extended to, extended to the animal kingdom as well. <laughs> So other works that are potentials for a question about continuity and change are works like Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and his three daughters from the Amarna period. You know, we've been talking for a while about the tradition of the reclining female body in European art, but here's another example of changes in the human body canon for the Egyptians. And Akhenaten is really the only pharaoh who upset the canon of the human body in art. So um, at least for uh, Egyptian art, I mean. So this work is a great example of continuity and change, as well as a number of other works. And so you like look at Mughal architecture, like the Taj Mahal. You could talk about how that represents continuity and change. Uh, Anchor Wat, uh, Wilfredo Lamb's Jungle, Cezanne's Mont Saint-Victoire, and so forth. So there's a, there's a variety of works you could talk about that draw on traditions, but also represent significant changes. So there's that plaque that I was talking about. All right, so what should we take away? One of the short free response questions on the art history exam requires an analysis of artistic traditions. This is called continuity and change. It is the very last FRQ, FRQ 6. It assesses students' ability to analyze the relationships between a work of art and a related artistic tradition, style, and or practice. One image from the set is provided. Students must respond to the prompt with both visual and contextual evidence. They must demonstrate how or why the work of art demonstrates continuity or change within an artistic tradition or practice. Students must also analyze the meaning or significance of an art historical interpretation of the work of art provided. And the skill of analyzing artistic traditions reflects 20 to 25% of the test and at least one FRQ. And final reminders and tips for the AP exam. Can't let you go before we do this. All right, multiple choice. Narrow it down to two choices or less. Remember, if it's half wrong, it's all wrong. Avoid absolutes like all, every, always, and never. And do the best you can. I know sometimes you'll have to guess between two choices, but just kind of whittle it down. Remember, if it's half wrong, it's all wrong. With FRQs, read the prompt carefully, count the tasks, take it one task at a time, check to ensure that you've answered all the tasks, and follow directions. You know, if it tells you to do something, follow the directions. All right, uh, complexity point. You know, for the long visual contextual essay, uh, consider making connections between the artwork and other artwork in your set. Um, if it's a relevant comparison, you can introduce a comparison or discuss continuity or change within re with regard to an artistic tradition now that you know what it is. Um, you can just dis discuss uh, the reception of that work by different audiences as long as it's relevant. And then when in doubt, add more information. You know, points are additive. So this, this is what I mean for the FRQs. FRQs, you should add more info if you're not sure if you got it because points are additive. You will not get points off for saying something wrong, but you will get points for saying something right. As long as it's new information, I should say. And then finally, when studying, pay extra special attention to context, uh, which, uh, which includes function. And you should use the AP daily vid videos for this. You should take the AP classroom practice assessments, review your answers, review why you missed an answer, why an answer is wrong. I, I can't say this enough. Pra practicing assessments really makes you much more comfortable with them. So here is a link to our AP Art History Google Drive folder that I showed you at the beginning. This is where you can find the resources for the last two weeks and AP exam info for art history. And please send any comments or feedback for these lessons. If you have any lingering questions that you want answered, just please be sure to include your email address in the comments and we'll do our best to try and address them with you.
And that's all for this week. Uh, you're going to do great. I'm rooting for you. And I just want to end with a brief shout out to my wonderful students at Corona Del Mar High School and my guru in art history, Mr. John Gunnan. So this is Vanessa Valdez signing off.